The chairperson and all the three speakers are very well known to you in various capacities. Also, UB Boite was the immediate past president of the Indian Sociological Society and also he was a very eminent sociologist and he uh, is chairing this session. And uh, Professor Andre Bette, you know that uh, he is a yes, Palpapurushan awardee and also author of so many books and he is an eminent sociologist and he has readily, when I invited him, he has readily agreed to be a speaker at the symposium. Likewise, Professor K. L. Sharma, author of so many books, an eminent sociologist and former Vice Chancellor of Rajasthan University and current Vice Chancellor of uh, Rajasthan uh, National University. And uh, Kameshwar Chaudhary, who is a professor at the Central University, Lucknow. So all the three eminent speakers are uh, very well known to you. So on behalf of the Indian Sociological Society, I would like to welcome the chairperson and uh, the symposium speakers. Thank you very much and I request Professor Boite to take over. Thank uh, Professor Boite. Uh, let me say how happy I am to be here with you this afternoon. I have not been a very conscientious member of the Indian Sociological Society, and I'm very conscious of that fact. And therefore, I feel doubly honored when I'm asked to address a gathering of this kind. I know that you have a busy round of workshops, seminars, meetings, and so on. But it's still nice to be here with you today. And uh, we have a strict chairman. And I will follow his instructions and stay strictly within the limits that have been allotted to me. Frankly, uh, when I was informed about the topic for this panel, I was a bit uneasy because it has become our practice today to talk about a crisis in everything. And I don't think that it solves very many problems by saying that there's a crisis in the universities, there is a crisis among the youth, there is a crisis in the middle class. But unfortunately, unfortunately, it will be very difficult to deny that there are very serious problems of governance. I think that you should just think and look at what is happening in Parliament and elsewhere now and think back on what it was like 60 years ago when we set out on this venture of building democracy in India. And you will see that things are in a state of, a state of great disorder. I'm not that everything is breaking down. I don't think that it would be fair to say that everything is breaking down and no progress has been made at all in any direction since we first adopted our Republican Constitution. But I think that if we look at the operation of democracy, if I may venture to say so, through the eyes of the architect of our Constitution, Dr. B.R. Ambedkar, I think he would feel very uneasy at the way in which the institutions of democracy have been operating in India. I think that there is no question about that, that he would be very, very uneasy about the way in which these institutions have been operating. And I think that we should give some thought to the reasons behind this, even if we are not able to find remedies for the problems which beset us. It's not that Dr. Ambedkar was totally unaware of what might happen, but uh, he had hoped that we would be able to create an institutional structure which would put some brakes on the free expression of all kinds of protests and movements in the country which subvert the institution of democracy. He talked about the grammar of anarchy. He talked about the possibility that movements of civil disobedience and other kinds of movements might in fact threaten the functioning of the institutions which he hoped would secure proper foundations once the country came into its own. And I would like to remind you of what he said then about movements of protest and civil disobedience. 
he had always been somewhat uneasy about such movements. At the final session of the Constituent Assembly, after the draft cons constitution had been presented, he said that, uh, well, there may have been some reason in the past for this kind of demonstration of disaffection because there were no other avenues open. We were ruled by a colonial power which did not have much respect for our rights. Now we have created our own state and therefore we should put some restraint on what we take to the streets from our institutions. And he had said that uh, the end of colonial rule has placed a great burden on us. We can no longer put the responsibility of whatever goes wrong on the British. Now if things begin to go wrong, we will have only ourselves to blame. And I think that that is forgotten. What he said about the justification for continuous movements of protest and demonstration under colonial rule and the restraints under which such movements had to operate in an independent nation taking account of the institutions that had been put in place by the constitution itself to try to remedy those kinds of problems that come up in every democracy. I think that when we look back on where things stood at the time of independence, what we notice, and this has stayed with us, what we notice is that we created a constitutional, a legal, and a political order which is based on equality. But we have inherited a social order which is one of the most hierarchical in the world. Inequalities of caste continue to exist. Inequalities of gender continue to exist. And new inequalities of class begin to emerge. And somehow this disjunction between our political ideals, which are the ideals of equality, and the social reality, which is present in all the countries of the modern world, in all democratic countries, there is this disjunction between the ideal of equality and the practice of inequality, but nowhere is that disjunction more acute than in our country. Just before independence, Pandit Nehru had said, the spirit of the age is in favor of equality, although practice denies it almost everywhere. Mr. Nehru was, you know, the builders of modern India were uh, acutely conscious of the disjunction between the spirit of the age which Mr. Nehru said was based on equality and the practice which was pervasively unequal. So he said the spirit of the age is in favor of equality, although practice denies it almost everywhere. But he went on to add, he went on to add, yet the spirit of the age shall prevail. When we look around, we find that the spirit of the age has not prevailed to the extent that Mr. Nehru had hoped, and the builders of modern India had hoped, to the extent that Dr. Ambedkar had hoped, and the others had hoped, it has not prevailed. And that is, I think, one of the major problems which we face in the operation of democracy in India. I repeat once again that this is a problem which democracies everywhere in the modern world have to confront. But we confront it in an even more acute form than other countries do. It's not that there are no inequalities in China. Whatever evidence we have, we find that those inequalities are probably increasing in China. But they do not have a democracy which enables them to give full and free expression to the discontent over the uh, inequality on the streets or in the Maidans. We have that, and it is good that we have this freedom and this liberty to express our discontent on the streets in the Maidans, but we express it a little too frequently in Parliament itself. And that, I think, leads to a kind of dislocation which erodes people's faith in the very institutions of democracy and therefore in democracy itself. 
Now, in the Constituent Assembly, again, I repeat that Nehru was a great optimist. I think Ambedkar was more realistic than Nehru. But nevertheless, he was also optimistic, at least at the time when the Constitution was being made. And he said, he said, democracy in India is only a top dressing on an Indian soil which is essentially undemocratic. Democracy in India is only a top dressing on an Indian soil which is essentially undemocratic. And when he said that, I'm sure he had in mind the hierarchies, the inequalities. Gandhi and the Gandhians glorified the Indian village. Dr. Ambedkar castigated the traditional Indian village, saying that this was the den of inequality, superstition, and so on and so forth. But again, I would say that at that historical moment, he had hoped that things would change and turn for the better. At least so I like to believe. Now, uh, when we see that things have not turned out as had been expected, we must ask ourselves, what is the problem? Is the problem rooted in democracy itself? Or is it that we have ourselves failed to operate democracy in the way in which we had hoped? I think that we will not be able to get a proper sense of what is happening to democracy in India unless we take into account certain basic tensions that are inherent in democracy itself. They are inherent everywhere. Although those tensions do not manifest themselves in the same way in all countries. What is the basic tension that is inherent in any democracy? I would say that democracy rests on a tension between two distinct principles. One is the rule of numbers. One is the rule of numbers. I don't think that we can have a democracy which does not respect the voice of the people. And the rule of numbers is an expression of the voice of the people. So democracy has to respect the rule of numbers. But that's not the only thing that democracy has to respect. Democracy also has to expect, uh, respect the rule of law, whether on one particular occasion the rule of law is or is not backed by popular support. There are procedures for changing the law if it is not backed by popular support. But that also has to be done through proper procedures. So I think that there is this tension between the rule of numbers and the rule of law, and I think that is inherent in every kind of democracy. And each democracy tries to achieve some kind of balance between the two. And if you look at our institutions of democracy, I will say that Parliament, and in particular the Lok Sabha, is designed to represent the rule of numbers, the voice of the people. Whereas the Supreme Court, which is an equally important institution, is designed to safeguard the rule of law, even against the rule of numbers. And it's not enough to say that Parliament can make laws which change the existing laws, but it cannot make such laws without passing muster with the Supreme Court. It cannot make such laws in an arbitrary and capricious manner. I think that depending on where the tension rests, you have various kinds of democracy. My friend uh, Ramchandra Guha, who has a great flair for coining catchy phrases, has described India as a 50% democracy. And I often tell him that the point is, you know, it is true that, that we have survived as a democracy. But we must ask ourselves what kind of democracy it is that we have created for ourselves. And without passing judgment, what kind of democracy is it? It is not the same kind of democracy 
which Nehru, Patel, Dr. Ambedkar set out to develop. It's a somewhat different kind of democracy. I'm not saying that it's a worse kind of democracy than what they had in mind. And I make a distinction between what I call populist democracy and constitutional democracy. Constitutional democracy gives emphasis to the rule of law, to legal procedures, whereas populist democracy gives primacy to the rule of numbers. And I think that between 1950 and 9, there has been a steady shift from the constitutional mode to the populist mode in the functioning of democracy in this country. I don't see any reason why Indian democracy has to have exactly the same form as democracy in England or America or France. Because in these countries themselves, democracy does not have the same form in England that it has in the United States. It does not have the same form in the United States that it has in France. So it's perfectly acceptable that each country in course of time will develop its own form of democracy. Only we must recognize what is happening. We must recognize what is happening. I mean, I, I think that uh, if we recognize what is happening, then we will be able to make sure that the institutions that we have created are properly protected. I think that what we need is to protect not only the Supreme Court, but we also need to protect Parliament. And that is what worries me very much, that the manner in which Parliament functions today, the manner in which Parliament functions today, shows perhaps sometimes that the members of Parliament have themselves lost respect in the institution in which they operate. And this is a, is a very, very worrying thing. Somebody has a mobile phone. Um, so. I, 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 I'm, 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 I'm very worried and very concerned about that. And I uh, agree with those who say that democracy has survived for 60 years, and it will continue to survive. I think it will continue to survive. I, I, have, I have no doubt about that. But if democracy is not given a fair chance in parliament, it will come out into the streets. And I think it is for us to decide among ourselves, would we like a democracy of the kind that found its expression in what is called the Arab Spring, in Tehri Square, in Tunisia, in Libya? Do we want that kind of democracy? If we look at what is happening in these countries, I was very apprehensive. Frankly, I did not expect that much good would come out of what was happening in Tehri Square in Cairo. I did not expect that much. And much good has not come out of that. I think that, you know, we run down democracy, the institutions of democracy. People have lost faith, both in government and in opposition. They have lost faith in the political parties. But we must recognize that if democracy is not given a chance in Parliament, it will come out into the streets. And then, then the only bulwark against that is military rule. And I think one thing for which we must give credit to the institutions of democracy in this country is that unlike in most countries in our neighborhood, the army has never had a significant part to play in public life. Over 60 years, the army has learned to respect, the military have learned to respect the institutions of democracy, even when those who are responsible for running those institutions have lost respect for it. The military in India has learned to respect. I don't think that we should assume that that respect will last forever. So when we encourage disorder and turmoil in the institutions of democracy. We must ask ourselves, what is the alternative that we have for those institutions? Thank you very much. Without uh, contradictions uh, from which our democracy is suffering, you also pointed out the cause of tension which democracy is suffering from the rule of number on one side and rule of law on the other side and parliamentary democracy and uh, 
Supreme Court, their uh, conflict with each other. May I now uh, call Professor Thank you, Professor Bhatti, Professor Vetei, Professor Kamesha Chaudhary, friends. Uh, uh, we have heard Professor Vetei, and uh, as it reflects that uh, the main institutions which have been there since independence particularly centering around Indian democracy as perceived by the two great leaders, Nehru and Ambedkar, have not been functioning and some of the ideals such as equality, justice, democracy itself have not come up to the expectations of these great leaders and visionaries. Uh, with this uh, historical background, certainly keeping in view, I would uh, deal with uh, on these two concepts, basic concepts, which are given in this symposium, uh, crisis and governance, crisis of governance. And I think uh, uh, these are uh, related, uh, particularly at the ground level, because crisis causes misgovernance, and governance of a particular nature can cause crisis. Now, certainly crisis denotes pathos of Indian society, or of any society, and governance refers to order and discipline in different walks of life. I heard part of the debate today on television, which is going on at Jantar Mantar, led by Anna's team today, today itself, and it's uh, uh, being a live uh, broadcast is there on some of the TV channels. And the those who are participating in the debate, particularly uh, the political leaders, they say that there is no governance today in the country. And because there is absence, lack of governance, therefore this general Lokpal bill and various provisions have been uh, floated in the country. Uh, anyway, uh, I, I do not know really, but uh, probably total absence of governance, as most of the people were arguing, some certainly said no, parliament is there, and parliament can discuss, debate, and can bring up about, can bring out a proper uh, relevant legislation and people should have faith in democracy in parliamentary institution. Now, I think uh, besides this, uh, more important way uh, is the way in which these terms uh, are defined. Uh, also, it is necessary to know uh, the context in which these terms are understood and used because these, these are used, misused, and particularly in certain given contexts. And then again, who are these people who are using or misusing these terms, uh, particularly in the political realm? Uh, we have, as sociologists, have hardly worked on the question of governance. Uh, as such, except uh, our fellow um, colleague, Professor Kameshwar Chaudhary, who brought out a a substantial volume about two or three years ago uh, on governance question. And uh, there, uh, summing up in the introduction, he talks about liberal, non-liberal, and radical nature of governance. Now, uh, <clears throat> without going into uh, what is conservative or radical change, uh, I would like to say that uh, that any kind of change uh, in the institutions, uh, which Professor Bethe was referring to, the institutions or creation institutions or change in institutions, uh, you know, have to be taken into consideration, could create crisis of some sorts. 
uh, maybe that uh, certain kind of a change does not bring about um, innovation, does not bring about change. There is a situation of status quo, uh, or maybe that change uh, is particularly in favor of certain sections of the society, and they are in a position to take maximum advantage of a particular institutional change. Now, this is to be seen that such a change would certainly create crisis. People would register against this change and come out uh, open. Maybe it takes time. Uh, so, one has to understand the nature of the change and its consequences, and probably that would determine the nature of the crisis or the problems in governance in the society. Uh, I think more important is, therefore, to situate governance uh, in everyday life and, and in social domains. Now, based on the nature of governance in everyday life, one can talk of a good governance, and people often say, this, is, this government is good, this party is good, these people are good that they are taking a right stand in the parliament, state legislature, or in village panchayat. Now, therefore, uh, one has to think of governance in terms of the desired type of society, which uh, professor, late Professor I.P. Desai talked once again about this notion of the desired type of society in uh, his presidential address to the Indian Sociological Society. So, in ultimate analysis, governance is for human development. And now, one needs to be very specific about human development also. Uh, and therefore, human development defined in terms of what? Uh, in terms of role of the individual, the self, the consciousness, uh, the role of the family, community, and the state, and significance, I think, of many factors, but particularly of education. Uh, because, I mean, education in uh, sense of quality education, and that means that people become uh, conscious about their rights, their responsibilities, and they accordingly they try to shape, uh, play their role in governance in society, or good governance in society. Now, uh, maybe that some of these aspects, because governance is not necessarily related to only economic development. I think governance is something that we is not cannot be seen just in terms of per capita income, or can, has to be uh, one has to think of governance that how things move in the society to the satisfaction of most or large sections of the people. I think that is the yardstick uh, of uh, good governance or uh, relatively uh, absence of crisis in society. Now. Certainly, uh, one can differ on the criteria of good quality of life or a good uh, society, but generally one can agree upon certain minimum indicators or indices of a good society or a good quality of life. Now, uh, 